Diversity Network Seminar for this term. Um, we're really excited to welcome Alifa Hake, who's close to finishing her DPhil and who is supervised by Natalie Seddon in Nature Based Solutions Initiative team. Um, her DFIL focuses on exploring sustainable fisheries in Bangladesh with a particular focus on sharks and rays. And she's here today to present uh, her insights on mitigating bycatch of sharks and rays in Bangladesh with uh, a lot of beautiful photos. So I'm very much looking forward to it. Over to you, Alifa. Thank you very much, Isil. That, that, that was an amazing um, introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, I'll try to share my screen, and then we can start. Um, yeah, right. Can you see it? Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, cool. Um, hi, um, you, as you have already heard, I'm Alifa Hawk, and I'm working with Sharks and Rays in Bangladesh for a um, few years now. Um, in my DFIL, I'm trying to look into um, sustainable shark fisheries, if possible, depending upon different aspects like the biological aspects of it, the social aspect of it, um, and trying to look into more um, priority species as there are a lot of species and um, it's very difficult to look all of them together. So before going into that, I just wanted to give a little overview of um, what species we have, what sort of fisheries we have, um, what kind of um, things going on in terms of shark um, and rays in, in Bangladesh. Okay, cool. Um, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about the fisheries context, um, context in Bangladesh in relation to sharks and rays, um, what species we have, what sort of trade that's happening and what kind of uh, conservation actions in terms of bycatch mitigation, trade mitigation, um, or social aspects that we need to think about um, before making a plan of conservation. What um, was important to know um, in terms of Bangladesh and also in the Indian Ocean region, this data is very um, scarcity is there, data, um, very fine scale data is not really available for um, uh, policies or, or better conservation actions. Um, so it's very important to actually uh, fill that data gap with baseline studies. So the uh, first few chapters of my PhD actually is about um, filling that da data gap for prioritizing and understanding um, what needs to be done um, on a priority basis for what species, um, for a unified, inclusive, and context-dependent model for mitigating mortalities of sharks and rays, um, especially in a developing country situations whereby resources um, are not that much. Um, my research premises, as I have already talked about, will be on species composition, their vulnerabilities, um, fisheries, um, and the part that I am not going to talk about today because I'm still working on that particular method is the sustainability analysis of these fisheries in Bangladesh. Um, as you can see, um, this is the coastline of Bangladesh. It's a um, huge and broken coastline um, from southwest. The habitat is very interesting. There is Shundarbans, which is the um, mangrove um, in the south central region. It's um, a very dynamic island, sand island system in the southeast. It's sometimes a little rocky, so we have a very good diverse um, habitat types going on, which is very good for different species of sharks and rays. Um, in the map, um, the right of, uh, side is, is about the areas where, I, where I'm working. These are my study sites in the southeastern. Um, there are four study sites we're working on in the southwest. Um, there are a few more that we are trying to um, collect the data from um, for our studies. Um, okay, I'll just, yeah. So the first thing is what species do we have? Um, so we have been collecting landing site data. So the data that um, I'm presenting today is um, fisheries dependent. Although it's not a very good proxy for what species we have in the ocean, um, because it depends on what species are being caught, but it can be a very, very good um, source of data in terms of what species we have in the coastal um, and marine waters of Bangladesh. So far, um, we have collected data on more than 80 species and 
by the day when we look into more data, the species number only increase. Um, most of the species that we have identified to be um, species level are sharks. Um, for rays, as we have started collecting the data a little later than sharks, um, the number is low, but it is not representative of um, how many sharks and how many rays are being landed. It's more of our um, sampling bias towards sharks, and that's why most of the species that we have found are sharks, which is 94%. Um, um, till date, um, in 2017 and 18, because beyond that we haven't um, analyzed the data, um, we have sampled more than 161,000 um, individuals of elasmobranchs, um, from small to um, larger ones. And as I said, um, there are more than 83 species that we have um, so far identified using morphological um, methods and also genetic methods as well. Um, in these data sets, what the interesting part that we have seen that many of the species that are being um, landed in Bangladesh in the artisanal fisheries are juveniles. If you see the graph, um, the shaded part of, um, of the species that you could see in the length-based um, size-dependent analysis that juveniles are caught um, in, in abundance. Apart from that, if you see the mean, um, which is in the red line in the graph, um, it is also mostly falling into the juvenile side. Um, we have um, analyzed the data for eight species so far, but in our um, experience and understanding for other species, the juveniles are also high in, in catch. Um, there can be different reasons for it. Um, it's, as it is a coastal bay, it's very highly nutritive. Probably it's a very good um, um, habitat for breeding and nursery grounds. That could be a reason. It can also be um, uh, the gear specificity that what sort of sharks are being caught. Um, it doesn't mean that we do not um, catch a lot of big sharks in, in the pre-monsoon um, to winter season. You would actually see a lot of pregnant big sharks um, and rays that are being landed. Um, many of the species um, are vulnerable. Um, according to the IUCN red list, um, if you can see the um, left side, the graph, um, most of them are either yellow, red, or um, dark red, which is critically endangered, endangered, and vulnerable. Um, in each family, you would see most of the sharks and rays are falling into the category um, of these vulnerable, uh, threatened categories. Um, the species that we have recorded so far um, 10 species are critically endangered, 20 are endangered, and many are vulnerable. Um, another interesting part is that many species are still data deficient. Um, so although they are not falling into the threatened category, we would know that um, it's a problem because um, before even we are collecting data or understanding their biology or fisheries, um, they might be um, depleting without um, our notice. Um, so that's, that's a problem as well. In another graph in the right side, you would see that um, almost the sharks that we have recorded, um, they are um, from different habitats and almost all habitat types um, that are found um, within the coastal and marine waters of Bangladesh. So um, we do have a very, very interesting diversity, but most of the sharks, many of the shark species and ray species are vulnerable um, due to fisheries trade um, and could also be of their biological characteristics, which is normally most of the sharks are very slow growing, the growth rate is slow and, and their reproductive rate is slow as well. Um, so they normally withstand um, cannot withstand fisheries pressure um, as other fin fishes or teleos fishes. So normally the fishing pressure that are probably okay for other species probably wouldn't be um, good for sharks and rays. And that's a reason that they are more vulnerable probably than other species. We also try to look into what gear types um, are catching more sharks than the others. So for each species, um, we have um, run a model and try to see um, that what um, length are being caught in what sort of nets so far. Um, we do need a lot more data sets to find a more nuanced understanding of that, but we are trying to see a pattern um, whereby for um, wedge fishes, guitar fishes, um, as they're targeted by long lines, that's the most destructive one. But apart from that, setback nets um, can be very destructive or any net which is bottom set. Apart from that, um, species which are benthic, um, setback nets, um, submerged gill nets um, of medium size has been very vulnerable, um, very problematic as well. Um, so that that is um, to try and understand and also advise some policies later on to try and understand what sort of um, gear modif modification or gear selectivity might help um, better um, bycatch mitigation. Um, but we need more work in that and more data points. 
Um, this slide particularly talks about um, where different type, uh, types of sharks stand in terms of threats. Um, so we looked into different categories. For example, if the shark is um, vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered, if it is protected by the national law or CITES um, or by um, or any other um, legal regime. Um, and then we created a threat score to see which sharks are doing um, legally well and what um, species needs to uh, get more legal protections, um, not only um, in, in Bangladesh, but in regional context. Um, in this graph, we have seen that the uh, uh, rays, um, uh, the wet fishes and guitar fishes in Rhinidae family, um, which are, uh, are most vulnerable because they're not protected um, in, in currently in, in um, Bangladeshi law, but I know that the law is under um, consideration and an amendment is gonna come. Um, but so far the data that we have, we found these sharks are extremely um, vulnerable. Now the hammerhead sharks on the other hand, they are equally vulnerable, but as they are protected um, in our graph, they show that they get some um, legal help. So probably a less threatened. Um, and if um, some sort of, um, in-field uh, protection level um, can be given, then they that would be easier for it to, to protect than the other sharks which are not protected. Um, so this graph was made just to try and understand, to make a priority list and that which um, species needs to go um, into legal uh, protection regime, which species needs more protection in, in the field in terms of bycatch mitigation, live release protocols, um, facilitation of the fishers for um, doing such stuff. Um, the next thing that I'm going to talk about is the fisheries aspect of it. Now, Bangladesh is, is a fisheries dependent country. There are many people directly and indirectly are depending on these fisheries. Um, we have uh, broadly three different kinds of um, practices, but um, of course it's, it's really broad. Um, the first one is subsistence, very traditional practices, small boats, um, not many numbers. Um, the second is artisanal practices. If you could see the, um, the two pictures at the, at the bottom of the slide, um, there are many artisanal boats from small to large sizes, um, which are going to the sea um, for catching fish every um, season, apart from a banned period in June and July in Bangladesh. Um, there are more than 67,000 boats which are licensed right now, but there are IU as well, which is unlicensed boat going to the sea um, to, to catch fish. Um, the fleets are very, very high. Um, we also have commercial um, scale fisheries, um, but in my studies, we did not collect any data from commercial um, um, uh, fishing practices. Um, as we also wanted to try and understand um, fisheries and fishers perspective on what sort of species there are, if we're missing something, um, as our data, the temporal length of our data is not very long. Um, we wanted to look beyond that what species were more common in Bangladesh and because of the fisheries practices, they're not very common anymore. Um, so we actually um, conducted um, many semi-structured questionnaire surveys, workshops with fishers to try and understand their practices, what species are being caught, if any species that has they don't see anymore um, has gone exhibited or has declined in, in great numbers. Um, although many of the fishers are, do not target sharks, um, they are mostly bycaught. Um, but beyond 2000, before 2010, there used to be um, seven to 10 boats which were targeting sharks with very big iron hooks, but that practice doesn't, um, it's, it's not there anymore. For rays, they're actually targeted with long line boats um, with hooks in one line. There could be from 10,000 to 30,000 hooks attached. Um, these are unbaited, go beyond to the, um, go down to the bottom of the um, ocean floor and catch mostly benthic rays. But when we asked them what are the species they are catching more, um, we found that most of the fishers said they are catching small size species like spade nose sharks and small size rays. Uh, the number is high for them. For other bigger sharks, they said the number is very low in comparison to what they used to catch um, for say five to 10 years before. This is a graph showing that what sort of change that has happened in terms of population of the species, according to, to the um, socio-ecological approach that we took um, for, and the interviews we have taken from, um, from the fishers. As you could see, the species that they say that they used to be common, but not anymore, are sawfishes, wedgefish, which is a rinkobata species, um, well sharks, they, see, they say they have seen a decline, um, mobula species, which are devil rays, hammerhead sharks, um, 
and um, other uh, some other different species as well. Now, interestingly, we also have seen this decline from literatures and our data collected from the landing sites, for example, for sawfish, for guitar fishes, um, the wedge fish, that Rinkobata species. Um, we haven't actually um, recorded one single species of Rinkobata species um, in our landing data, which used to be quite um, moderately common um, at least 10 years before. So what data the fishers were um, giving us was quite um, similar what we're seeing um, from the landing site data collection. Um, they also have um, informed us that they are um, not seeing more large species. Um, they're saying less valuable species. By valuable, they meant the species that um, bring more money. For example, wedge fishes, guitar fishes, hammerheads, um, they have seen less species in terms of diversity um, and less, less um, large sharks as well. Um, within their fishing carrier, uh, most of the fishers have sen, sen, said that um, the species and, and the population, the size of the catch has decreased. One fisher actually said that um, 10 to 15 years ago, there used to be a time when they had to actually discard the shark because there wasn't uh, much space left in the boat to take them. Um, that is not the case anymore. One fisher said, um, in recent times, they, they went for fishing with, um, with the long lines and found one ray in a seven day period um, of, of um, their fishing practices. So that's interesting that how the species and the population might have gone um, really um, depleted. To understand more species specific um, population decline, um, we uh, made a pictorial guide for sharks, which are easily identifiable um, by the fishers. Um, for example, whale shark, Tiger shark, um, hammerhead as a group, not a single species. Sawfish as a group, there are three species that are confirmed, uh, that are found in Bangladesh. Um, wedge fishes, guitar fishes as one group, um, and big carcarinids as one group. As you can see, the most darkest reds for sawfish and um, rinkobata species, which fishers think that have been extirpated. Although sawfish catch um, is very, very low, but there's still some catches that we have found in our studies. For rinkobatas, we did not. Um, so some, th these are very interesting insight that can actually help us to try and understand what species to make priority um, in Bangladesh. The next thing um, I wanna talk about is the trade of these species um, and what happens after they are being caught. Um, there is not a single part um, in the sharks or rays body that, that do not have a demand or, or that cannot be sold. From the fins to meat, which are high quality products and yield a lot of money um, and skins, there are unconventional products like um, the, the bones, the cartilages, um, the um, jaws, the rostrum, um, and um, intestines, um, liver, liver oil. Um, all these things have a certain type of um, value and a demand um, and, and the whole, um, the network of this demand and the people and the stakeholders is quite complicated, uh, both in national and also in international um, um, uh, scenario that what's happening. Um, so these are all the products that you're seeing in the photos that, that can be made from a shark or a body. Um, we try to map where are the products going um, from interviews and also from observations that we had um, in the field. Um, we have found that many of these products are from um, 2014 and beyond are going specifically to Myanmar and from Myanmar to China. Before 2014, I used to go to an array of different countries using a different routes um, from airways to, to waterways um, to Thailand, Malaysia, um, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, even in, in United States. In 2017, there was one um, consignment that was seized in the United States, probably in Florida, um, that was um, actually um, from Bangladesh. So that's very interesting that probably there is some sort of um, trade going on, which is not under, um, of course, the radar of our accounting system and, and the national um, accounting systems. Um, we try to um, also see the, uh, the, the map of the stakeholders, like who are the biggest stakeholders running these trade businesses and getting the most um, benefits from it, because that will give us an idea that what stakeholders to actually um, prioritize in terms of interventions um, and to work with. We have found um, more than 30 different stakeholders, small to medium to big in terms of um, their capacity to buy sharks and ray product and then export it or um, in, in disseminating it in, in the national markets. Um, and we found out that most of the traders in the Southeast 
Eastern region are the biggest stakeholders in terms of the international um, trade that is happening for um, fins and meat um, and sometimes skin as well. Um, many of the traders from the southwestern and the southeastern region are actually sending their um, products, fins and meat, to the southeastern traders to actually do um, the biggest market. It's all to depend. It also depends on, on the financial capacity of buying this much of sharks and processing them and producing the products um, that are ready to, to um, trade um, in, um, to Myanmar and then to China. Um, and we try to actually see how these networks look. And it, as you see, it, it actually is very complicated in terms of what sort of relationships um, they're sharing um, in terms of if there is a fisher or they're a trader or a seller or an agent who is um, doing this. Um, businesses. An interesting analysis that we did to try and understand um, that the accounting system that is present in Bangladesh, how, how good this is. Um, the sad part is that so far um, for Elasmo Brown's sharks and rays, there is no set protocol in the landing sites for accounting what's being landed and then try and understand um, how much we are landing. So most of the um, information available in the national statistics are quite conservative um, and underestimated um, as well. Now, um, the average um, landing that we have seen um, um, is, is probably four to 5,000 tons um, in Bangladesh from the Department of Fisheries Statistics, but see around us says, it is a reconstruction study says that it is probably close to, close to 8,000 um, tons. But um, the products and the traded amounts that we have found from the fish, um, from the traders in the last three years, we tried to understand if that much of product needs to be made, how many or how much um, in terms of weight sharks you might need. Um, and in that, we found at least from 8,000 to 20,000 tons of sharks might have uh, been landed in Bangladesh and all has been unreported. Um, there's a reason be, uh, behind this because there are many places in Bangladesh throughout the coast where um, sharks are landed and then sold to the traders or the people who are ready to actually process them to make them the products. Um, it's not only the formal landing sites where the accounting systems are present. Um, also, in the um, national statistics um, or accounting system, um, they are focused in the BFDC um, landing sites, which are the formal landing sites um, in Bangladesh, and they wouldn't really count many landing sites in the southwestern and south central region um, where landing is can be typically very, very high um, in the fishing season. So um, it is unreported um, in mo most cases still now is unregulated. Um, there is a reason behind that as well because sharks and rays are being protected um, by the law from 2012 and it's not been very long. It's, it's about eight, nine years um, from a law to be um, enacted, to be implemented, it needs time. Um, also, it needs awareness generation amongst the people, the fishers and the traders who have been trading and fishing on the species for decades, um, probably within this short period of time, it wasn't possible to um, reach every fisher and every trader about this. Um, but the good thing is there are a lot of projects that are working in Bangladesh, which is trying to mend that data gap. Now comes um, to the important part, is, um, which is about conservation, right? Um, and, and the mitigation of bycatch, um, it really is not as simple as it sounds that we need to mitigate bycatches. There are so many different aspects that needs to be um, considered. Um, from my presentation so far, you must have known that it's, it's very complicated in terms of different sorts of species. Now, not every species has the same capacity to um, withstand the same pressure. So we need to understand what species are the most vulnerable in terms of their biology. Um, that's one thing. That's a huge body of research, research that needs to be done. Um, the second part is trying to understand who are these people um, who are related to this um, fishing and trading businesses and what are their vulnerabilities, what sort of facilitation they might need in terms of for abiding by any law or any regulation that are going to come um, in, in terms of this species. Even if they agree to um, abide by these regulations, do they have the means to do it? And by means, I mean, um, do they have the technological help for bycatch, mit bycatch mitigation? And if um, that's, that's gonna be provided by the government or the people who are working around it. Um, so just to um, summarize that how complicated is this and what sort of things that need to be focused when we are making a plan um, is, is 
um, I've tried to do it for one single group of fish. Um, these are the wedge fishes, um, guitar fishes. Um, in Bangladesh, we have um, about nine species um, of rhino pristitormis rich, which are sawfishes and um, guitar fishes. And um, what we have found that the first thing we need very um, species specific advanced research. Um, and, and that, that encompasses biology, ecology, habitat. Um, we need trade mitigations and enhanced trade monitoring um, systems um, using innovative mechanisms. So for example, most of the species which are protected, um, if you slaughter it, if you cut it and made into products, and if it is not a fin, even if it's a fin, it's really difficult for an untrained eye to identify if it's a protected species or if it's not a protected species. Um, so you need to um, use innovative trade mechanisms, uh, monitoring mechanisms, and that can be mini bioSA genetic analysis that can be uh, training the people at, at the customs offices, at the, um, at the local level in the landing sites. Um, there has to be a huge awareness generation regarding the regulations of, of the fisher to the fishers and the traders because in our studies we found many fishers and traders would know that there is a piece of law which protects sharks and rays but most of them wouldn't know what to do with it um so what exactly this law says which exact species are protected what can they do what can't they do what they need to do this so there is a huge confusion around this um so awareness is a big thing and another thing about trade mitigation is that disincentivizing the um, in incentivizing these traders um, to tr not trade this um, products. Now, legal terms is not only going to work here. It 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 needs to be more of a democratized process whereby these people have their say um, and they pioneer their um, actions through community level actions rather than someone monitoring them on the top because um, it would need a lot of money and a lot of resources for a country like Bangladesh to monitor every landing place and every boat that is going to the sea um, if they're catching it or not catching it. Um, so that something is very important to think about it. We need to um, protect our critical habitats for priority species. Um, we have to identify the nursery and the breeding grounds um, and that would be also important for more best, more uh, tailored um, fishing or sp uh, spatial closure. Um, we can't really close everything, but we need to find those areas which will have more impact um, from probably a less area and trying to understand what vulnerable species are in those um, areas. We need sustainable fisheries approaches um, rather than an umbrella ban on everything. Um, and we need to think about other fisheries practices as well, and not only elasmo branches. For example, um, in our recent experience, we have seen in the South Central region, um, one fisheries practice is, is the shrimp um, trawlers. Now they catch huge number of shrimps um, in a certain season, and only the shrimp is the product that they can sell, sell, and everything else that are caught in these fisheries, and that's more than 15 different species of crabs, other fish, um, sea mantis, sharks, and rays that are caught and discarded and, and thought about as rubbish. Now, if you could think about a more sustainable and efficient value chain um, of every species that have been caught in a more sustainable practice, then other um, like pressures for other fisheries are going to lessen anyways, because they are getting more money from more sustainable um, actions. Um, we, we need to think about the trawling practices. We need to think about size selection rather than uh, banning everything. And all this needs um, goes back to the important part that we need more research. Um, the next and the last and the most important thing I cannot um, emphasis enough is the empowerment of the local people and the stakeholders through um, not a beneficiary driven project, but a participation driven project, whereby they are the pioneers and people who know and from the government, from the practitioners, from the researchers can facilitate them for doing what they need to do um, in terms in terms of conservation. Um, I know I have talked a lot about a lot of things and it was not very focused, but when we want to talk about sharks and rays and their fisheries and how to mitigate bycatches and, and what motivations and what sort of things we need to do for different stakeholders, it gets very complicated. And it's important um, to actually acknowledge that complex um, relationship, that social fabric before coming up um, with a plan to um, or a law or a regulation, a piece of um, uh, planning that, that needs to be done. Um, and it cannot be looked into as a single fishery of sharks and rays or a bycatch thing. It has to be um, imagined and think as, as a um, holistic thing of all the fisheries that's happening um, 
in Bangladesh or any developing country um, scenario. One last example that I want to say that in Bangladesh um, currently, the Hilsha fishery, which, which has been um, uh, like a flagship project for Bangladesh, whereby um, a ban in Hilsha fishery has, has um, produced a lot of um, yield in that particular <coughs> fisheries for Hilsha. No, nobody actually looked into how much bycatch are happening in Hilsha fisheries in regards to sharks and rays. Um, if we really factor in that particular aspect into the Hilsha fishery, it doesn't remain a sustainable fishery anymore. <coughs> Excuse me because it is catching a lot of sharks and rays. So it is a holistic problem. It, it needs to look into um, different problems before coming up, um, coming up with, with the solutions, um, maybe that bycatch mitigations or, or any sort of a management regime. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Alifa, that was amazing. Lots of information, as you say. And um, but really clear, and you have um, so much passion. It's just wonderful to see all the work you're doing on this. Um, could I encourage people to put their cameras on and uh, join me in congratulating Alifa on the amazing amount of work you've done? Um, you've been collecting data for two, three years now, I think, if I remember well, and you have um, such a huge data set. Um, I'll, uh, I've got loads of questions, but I'll let someone else ask first. <laughs> sure. Does anyone have questions? Okay, I'll, I'll get going then. Um, well, first you, you started by saying you're, so you have no data from commercial fishing practices. And uh, I imagine a lot of the work that you're doing can be applied to commercial fishing practices and to improving their monitoring methods and, and uh, their response. Um, it's it's uh, very true. And with commercial practices, there is an added um, um, uh, advantage as well, because they already have GPS, sonar, um, tracking devices installed in their in their um, vessels. Now, if, if there is a regime like by the government or, or the fisheries authorities, whereby this data is shared, um, if not, if they're not happy to share it on a, on a public domain, with the fisheries practitioners, or probably even even with the fisheries authorities, uh, it will be much easier to uh, you know monitor what's happening in there. Um, because for artisanal fish, um, fisheries, there is no log booking, no um, monitoring systems on board because of different problems. But with commercial practices, it's very different. Um, they have a lot of money. The financial background is good, um, so it's easy to monitor them if. Um, the you know the framework is there that the data needs to be shared or we want to track it. So yeah, I think a lot of it is is can be um, used in commercial scale fisheries as well. Um, but it, it's going to be very easy um, to do that if they're on board. Yeah. If they're on board. <laughs> um, would anyone else have comments? Who else has got a question, Rose? Hi, thank you so much for your talk, Aletha. Uh, that was fascinating. I can't wait to read the paper when it comes out. Um, I wanted to ask, when you were interviewing um, kind of participants in the Alaska Bank fishery, did you take account of their age and kind of how shifting perceptions, shifting baselines of what people are catching, what they've seen in the past would influence their answers? Um, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. Um, we did take a lot of um, demographic information like age, education, um, earnings, their backgrounds, where are they from, why did they come in this particular region to fish, but we could not really analyze all of that into um, what I have written so far, but um, we did see actually a trend. Um, so we need to run some models to see if they are significant or not, but we did um, through ANOVAS, we actually um, saw that people um, with more experiences, so for example, the age is more than 45 or something, have um, more passion, um, how would I put it? So more interested into sustainable practices um, as opposed to people who are more younger for some reason. Um, that's something. And also it'd be very interesting if we could go like, you know, beyond that, analyze those data. But so far I haven't actually. Trisha. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, Alifa, thank you for that amazing presentation. 
Um, so I just had a quick question. You spoke about the trade of philosopher brand products and how they're um, exported to these different countries. And I don't know if I may have missed this, but is there um, a lot of local domestic consumption of Shakinray meat as well? And if yes, do you know who the main consumers are and to what extent they're actually depending on these products for their food? And if that's something that needs to be considered when you're talking about their um, management? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, that's that's yeah, amazing question. We did actually, so um, we do have a very niche market, um, national market for sharks and ray products. Um, the sharks especially, and so there is a taboo in, in the Muslim communities, which is the dominant communities in Bangladesh, um, that shark meat is prohibited um, um, and, and a lot of people would not eat it. Um, but in the tribal communities in, in the coastal regions and also the hill tracts of Bangladesh, which is in the southeastern region, um, not southeastern, the eastern region, um, in the hill tracts, um, you would see a huge market. So the smaller to medium sized sharks actually would go to these markets. Um, for the international markets, it's always the bigger sharks, um, the bigger size fins, um, the meats and the skins and everything else. But for the medium to, um, and by medium, I am saying like 70. Um, a millimeter to to about 70 centimeter to about 150 centimeter um, of the sharks would actually go to um, these tribal communities either fresh or dried um, now we actually had um, interviewed more than 200 consumers in this um, tribal communities and try to understand if it is a practice so important for them and if they depend on this particular thing so that we can factor that in, in into our recommendations um, but we found that it is a practice that they are doing for, for a long time, but they do not solely depend on this uh, meat for protein because there are other dry fish options for them. Um, but it is something they, you know, uh, seldom go buy the fresh meat and would eat it. For rays, it's absolutely different. For rays, we do have a um, demand not only in the tribal or in the coastal communities, but in the cosmopolitan cities as well. Um, rays would come as far as to the capital city sometimes, it would go to Chittagong, um, which is another cosmopolitan city, um, and, and there is a huge demand for that. Um, but um, I can't say this is negligible, but that's um, less than what pressure is coming from the international demands for meat and, and fiends because of the price um, it is bringing in. But yeah, we do have a niche market for these things, yes. Um, we have a question from uh, Nuas. Uh, he's wondering, or she, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, she's wondering if um, you have Gangetic shark in your estuary rivers or if they're now extinct from Bangladesh region. Um, we do have Ganges shark, if, if you that's what you are saying, the glyphy species. Um, so um, we recorded Glyphis gangeticus from Bangladesh from several species, um, several individuals actually from 2017 till now. Um, we do have a paper, I'm gonna probably mail it to you um, on that. Um, so no, they're not extinct, but of course they're critically endangered. Um, and given that the species actually come to the fresh waters as well, probably within Shundarbans, um, also the coastal rivers as well, the pressure is high from the freshwater fisheries practices, um, from other habitat degradation and uh, other, other anthropogenic um, problems that we see. Um, so they're not extinct, but extremely rare and also endangered because of, yeah, because of many problems. Rose. Hi, um, I had two more questions if that's okay. Um, first of all, I was wondering if you have a Kind of a shark liver oil fishery that you're aware of in Bangladesh and or anything else like, like um use of the cartilage the kind of ground into a powder in any form um and also if uh given what you now know about the distribution of the different species around Bangladesh if you have um any plans or hopes to kind of tag species seeing where exactly they're moving and therefore where you can kind of discuss with fishermen well maybe at this time of year don't fish here leave them a few weeks yeah thank you Roz. um amazing questions again so um we do have a demand for shark liver oil um so in my photos um in one of the slides that i've shown that what uh, the traders do is whenever um shark or ray is caught in the liver they would store it in a drum or a, or somewhere in a pot um and then they will wait and then they will um actually burn it um and and will take the oil out 
and there are um, especially fish feed industries. They would collect this oils to mix it with fish feed or poultry feed. Um, and the reason behind is they say that the, fit, or the feed float because it's oil and there is a fishy smell. So um, it's, it's probably better for the fish to, um, for some reason, it's, it's um, better for the fish to eat it. That's what they believe because we interviewed um, about 20 fish feed um, factory owners as well. So we do have it. Um, so that's one about the cartilages. So it's very interesting. So we have found that people from the Northeast Bangladesh, which is top of it, like very far away from the coast and where the sharks are, um, people would come from um, those part of the uh, of Bangladesh and collect um, the cartilages um, in, in very low and cheap price. Um, and we'll take it and then uh, they will use it in village medicinal practices. Um, so, for example, arthritis, kidney problems, and whatnot, um, and, and they would sell it to villagers and, and other people. We have um, um, evidence that some of these cartilages are also going to India through the border, um, through illegal means, and, and the adjacent villages um, from, from Bangladesh, they, they are also using the same things um, as, as medicinal practitioner, practitioner, uh, practices, but um, I haven't heard anything thing about if they are you know making them powders or making any sort of uh, medicines or not up until um, that hasn't come um, into our studies but of course in medicinal practices they're using it um, for example one very interesting thing is that um, sawfish meat right many people in the coastal Bangladesh believe that sawfish meat would cure cancer um, and they even if um, some of the educated people wouldn't believe it but would collect it um, just in case um, and that they are hugely priced in comparison to any other sharks or rays. The price is really high for, for a sawfish. So these sort of things are there. The last question that you have, well, that's the dream, right? If you could identify those habitats um, and can identify the breeding period or the period which is uh, the, the duration of the year, which is most important for this um, animals to breed or more critical and then have some spatial management. Um, we are um, starting a project um, and, and it has postponed for the pandemic for a year now um, uh, with Save Our Seas Foundations, um, whereby we are we will be um, with the help of the fishers, um, we'll use vessel trackers um, and, and some, some technologies to identify the critical habitats for guitar fishes um, and wedge fishes, which are the priority species we are thinking, um, which are all almost all critical endangered or, or data deficient. Um, if we get better data in terms of like absolute, you know, um, habitats that we could found. We do have some maps where they're going, they're very broad at this moment, but with this technology, we might find um, like, you know, more focused areas whereby this sort of special management can be done, but that's the dream. Thank you. Um, I've got Izzy next. Hi, yeah. Thank you, Alifa, for your amazing talk. It's so interesting. Um, I wanted to ask two questions, if that's all right. The first one is directly linked to what Trisha asked in that, do you think, or do you know if this is a significant source of income for the fishers and what portion of that income comes from the sharks of rays? And secondly, um, could you give an idea of the practical types of methods that could be used to reduce bycatch? Um, I hear what you're saying about like understanding the breeding season and stuff, but maybe you have other ideas. Yeah, thank you, Itzi. Yeah, um, yes. So um, your first question is is about the dependency of fishers and traders on this on this fishery. So the target practices that that we have for re um, that that I talked about the long lines with huge number of uh, hooks, the entire incomes come come from um, that particular practice, right? Um, so they fish for five to six months in the whole year because that's the season um, that ends. Um, so it is ending now, which is like the starting of the summer or mid summer. So they would fish from um, winter to the summer. Um, so that's like six, seven months and they wouldn't fish. Um, so though for those target fishers, um, it is the sole mean of, of um, um, income. Um, most of the fisher that we have interviewed and now it's more than 1000 um, do not really have a secondary income source. Um, so some of them would have like, you know, um, like a shop, maybe they would um, work as a laborer in a farm in, in the band period or in the period when they are not um, fishing, but most of the fisher would not have that secondary means of income. So they depend on fisheries. But for the bycatch practices, so for example, they go for hill shark fishing, but they're catching a lot of um, sharks and rays. In those cases, um, many of the fishers wouldn't depend solely on sharks and rays. It's an added income. 
Um, there's another interesting thing that needs to be um, addressed here is that um, the income generation um, ways from fisheries in Bangladesh. So most of the fishers do not have their own boats or own nets. Um, they would take a debt from the boat owner or the trader and they will take the debt for um, uh, 15 days or seven to 15 days and go to the um, sea and catch fish. And by default, whatever they catch belongs to the people from where they have got the debt and they will get um, either a little bit of salary um, or a little bit of the profit if he's the um, captain of the boat, not the other fishers. And that is 30 to $40 every 15 days. So that's like 50 um, to $60 sometimes um, in a month. So you can imagine like, um, so even the dependency, um, you can't really, apart from the target ray fisheries, you can't really um, pin it to the exact fishing types. It depends on the boat owners or the traders who are actually the owner of the boats and the nets. Um, so the stakeholders that more needs to be intervened with are the boat owners, um, the captains of the boat who have the um, more authority in taking decisions and have the financial capacities. For the other fishers who are working as laborers in the boat, actually do not have much to say in, 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 this, in this whole thing. Um, just arms are very little thing, yeah. And I forgot your second question, I'm sorry. Don't worry, that was a lot, it's super interesting. Um, the second one was about methods for reducing bycatch, which I guess that's a huge question, but. Um. Yeah, I mean, there have been many projects um, whereby different sort of mechanical solutions are coming into being. So for example, in one of the projects, um, in, probably in Indonesia, um, I forgot. So they are trying um, like lights, LED lights in nets, um, where they're seeing that that doesn't attract rays. Um, so that's one way, but that's something um, also have some sort of a um, plastic pollution, you know, impact might have. Um, so every idea has some sort of a consequences. Apart from that, for priority species like sawfish or wedge fish, we have to go for live release protocols. Um, so if you catch one, if it is entangled, you have to release it alive if possible and um, training and facilitations needs to be given to those fishers. Um, apart from that, you also can think about, so for example, some of the data that we have used to analyze what gear type um, catches more sharks than the other or what mesh size. And we have found out that same nets are catching more uh, pelagic rays. Um, so probably when we're thinking about pelagic rays, we need to think about same rays and medium sized submerged gill nets rather than all sort of nets. Um, so those data is gonna help us to probably have more focused in terms of um, get more focused in terms of what nets to use, what gear selectivity, what mesh size. Um, I don't think we'll ever be able to come to a point whereby all uh, bycatch is mitigated, um, but to you know reduce it to some extent, um, yeah, we, we probably can use those data and come, come with an idea, yeah. That's great. Um, I've got Sanjeev next. Uh, hi, so um, my question relates to your field work. So, um, you know, there are plenty of laws in Bangladesh and so national laws, and then there are, of course, international laws that sort of focus on, you know, conserving sharks and rays and endangered um, species. So my question kind of relates to the impression that you got when you returned from the field as to the awareness of these laws amongst fishers and traders. I mean, how much do they really know about these laws? Um, and then, of course, there's a subsequent question, which is, if, if by any chance the awareness isn't as much as we would want it to be, um, what do we do about this? How do we tackle this? Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Sanjeev. These are very important question in terms of um, implementation of any, any sort of laws. Um, so we have, in, I touched upon a little bit in, in my talk about this. So we have interviewed um, for different projects more than a thousand fishers now and traders as well. In 2016, 17, in the interviews, we found that many of the fishers wouldn't know there is a law. And the law was um, enacted um, probably into the, um, yeah, in 2012. Uh, so that's not a very long time. But in our more recent interviews, so be that 2019 and 20, we have found many fishers actually do have some knowledge about a law, the existence of a law which prohibits catching some, some sharks and rays. But the problem is nobody really knows what exactly are these, what, what this law says them to do. 
Um, do they not catch it at all? Do they release it? Um, if, if a shark is dead and it is entangled in the net, what do they do? Um, they, do they just um, you know, take it to the, to the landing sites? Um, so these sort of very important knowledge is absolutely absent. Um, but the idea that there might be a law which is um, uh, prohibiting them to catch and trade on them, um, some fishers and traders would know that. Um, but the problem with that is um, like less, you know, the information which is not enough for them is not good information. And the access to information is not there as well. So for fishers, there isn't a single place where they can go and ask for this information um, and can seek some help that how to abide by this. So yes, these things are absent and, and a huge effort needs to go down to this line of awareness generation um, about what's there. And I also believe it's not only about awareness generation, it's about taking into account their saying as well. Now, these people are um, fishing for, for decades now, some for four decades. Um, for them to just have a new regulation is very difficult. Um, fishing is, is, is embedded in their social fabric. It's not just a livelihood. It's something they do. It's, it's their tradition. It's, it's their life sometimes. So for them to change that, needs a lot more work than just to awareness generation. And by awareness generation, I'm saying just me going there, telling them, well, this is the law, you need to do this. This is never gonna work. So it, it's very important what languages we use, what methods we use, if it is democratic, if they are on the table as well, do they have the um, access and right to say what they need to say in terms of how these laws are going to be made, implemented, and how they're gonna abide this by? So yeah, very, very interesting and import, important um, questions. And, and yeah, it, it's very complicated, but I think we have a long way to go in, in the, um, that sector as well. Your second question was about- I, I, think you, I think you answered it. I mean, how, how could we possibly tackle it? Um, yeah. Yeah, so as I said, it, it, um, it has to be, uh, I believe it has to be absolutely democratic. And, and by that, it's not about just going there, running a workshop, coming down with the data, and you do your thing. You actually have to sit with them um, in, in a round table, see what they have to say, um, see if that's doable. And interestingly, I haven't found one fisher who do not want fish in the sea or who wants sharks to go extinct. They have questions as well, like why the fish are going down so much, why the depletion rate is so high, what can we do? Um, you have to understand these fishers are depending on these fisheries. Um, if these fisheries are depleted, we might leave, they wouldn't. Um, so their voices are more important um, to, to be. Um, and when they are the people who are pioneering such decisions, um, awareness works better. Uh, on that note, we have a um, question from Dilshad. I think, or I will ask um, a question. Um, they're asking, what do you think uh, why, why have sharks become this vulnerable, particularly in Bangladesh, compared to other regions? Hi, thank you. Thank you for your question. Well, um, sharks are vulnerable globally. It's particularly not for Bangladesh. My case study is Bangladesh. That's why probably it's sounding that it's worse in Bangladesh. Um, but um, around the globe, um, it, is, it, it is a burning issue um, of the decade, I would say. Um, many people are working around it, trying and understand this. But the basic reason why sharks and rays are vulnerable because of the biological characteristics. Um, they're slow growing animals. Um, many species um, probably reach to um, the reproductive age after 10 years. Um, many species don't, they, they reach it much earlier, but then again, there are species like that. Many species breed once in two years, one pup. Many species probably breed five to six in every year. So it's not like other fish, whereby the number of eggs are really high um, and, and the breeding cycle is much um, closer to one year to another. Um, that's a big reason that if you are taking out more species of um, before they reach to their reproductive um, age, that's recruitment overfishing, which means you are not leaving enough fish to breed for the next season. So as you could see in our case study in Bangladesh, many of the fish that we're catching are juveniles. So they haven't reached to um, the age class whereby they could uh, breed at least once. So this is a big reason why um, this huge fisheries pressure um, is more um, problematic for sharks and rays. Um, that's a biological reason. Apart from that, if you can 
look into the trade and and the amount of money that is generated from sharks and rays it's huge it's it's a um, billion dollar endeavor um annually that to the data was from 2014 and 15 globally it's more um today um so yeah it's it's a it's a business it's like another corporate business looking into the world in a capitalistic um um lenses so of course people are um trying to get more more of these products out of the sea um so yeah i mean there are two reasons out of many why um apart from that climate change habitat degradation um yeah so many other things that are yeah. oh um on that note alifa i have a question um you've been doing a lot of raising awareness uh, throughout your the last few years and i'm wondering what your main messages are on the consumer side um the one thing that i could say is educate yourself like know what you are eating what impact that does um to to the ocean to the species that you are eating um and by educating yourself i'm not talking about just reading the label uh, of the product you're buying and and just decide it's good and it's bad um information are available there are amazing organizations who are running campaigns education materials and the information is available there are people who are happy to talk to you if you knock them um so from the consumer base who have the access to the information um i have one thing to say is educate yourself before you're buying um, a fishery product and and that's that starts from seafood to the leather like a money bag or a purse that you're buying might have shark fin um, sh shark skin uh, or a ray skin in it um the consumers who are in the developing countries eating meat like fish meat um the shark meat that's a little different the message has to be a little different um these are the people um in the coastal areas do not have a lot of means for proteins apart from fish um and in bangladesh and not talking about um not generalizing this information in bangladesh um we are a, a nation who depends um, uh, for the protein on fish not only fresh water in coastal areas also um seafood as well um for them we have to come up with better alternatives in the coastal areas and it is not going to be difficult for sharks and rays because we already have very very interesting alternatives other fin fishes which can be um you know um taken out of the sea more sustainably than sharks and rays Thanks Alifa that's just amazing. Just one last question and I think we'll wrap up. Um I'm just wondering what what's next for you then? Are you going to continue in the research or are you going into well what what's next? <laughs> yeah, oh okay. Um the first thing is successfully finishing the PhD, right? Um so I'm still writing these papers that um I presented. Um of course, um I do want to continue with this, in this field. Um, um it's not only the data that we have collected it, it's a sort of a feeling that you have when you interview a person it's very difficult um in the fishing you're going to the fishing villages you can't really just be a person go and collect the data use it and done you somehow feel a little bit of responsible to going back to the same community and letting them know what you did with this data um did it help did it is it going to help them um so i kind of feel a little bit of responsible in that particular area that i have to go back to these communities whereby i have i have been collecting the data for such a long time i do have a lot of a lot of local uh, data collectors who are working with me in in all these landing sites i do have a little bit of responsibility feeling of responsibility towards that as well that we do have to do something whereby these people feel a little bit um satisfy that we did something good um with this line so i i want to continue um with with this research and at the end of the day i really want to come up with um, a unified model whereby the social biological economic aspects are you know embedded and integrated um into a more tailored solution for sharks and rays in bangladesh That's amazing. Um and we're here to help you in any way we can now and and when whatever you choose to do next. Um that's it. Thank you so much for all coming and we will see you next week. Is that right, Carly? <laughs> I think so. We'll see you next week, Wednesday at 10. I'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was it was amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Alifa. Thank, Thank you. you.